Coming up on DTNS, hope for solar and wind as battery installations rise. We try to make sense of Jack Dorsey's attack on Web3. And the tech hero you crave may have been with you for decades. <laughs> This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, December 21st, 2021. Happy solstice, everybody. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Roger. Oh, I'm Roger, Roger. Chambers, show's producer. And here it is. Ended up the season. Your boy, Big Chris Ashley. What's up, my peoples? Uh, we have Chris Ashley with us. <laughs> Once again. Uh, yeah, but folks, we got we got some good stuff coming on. We were, were just having some fun with uh, uh, Whamageddon and more, uh, talking about our favorite holiday songs on Good Day Internet. You can get that wider show at patreon.com slash DTNS. Big thanks to our top patrons. Today they include Dan Boyles, Logan Larson, and Mike Akins. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Xiaomi announced on its official Weibo account that it will launch the Xiaomi 12 series on December 28th. The company started phasing out its Mi branding earlier this year, so people have been in interested in what's coming up. A marketing poster for the new phone features Chinese sprinter Su Bingchan, which may point to the 12 series being China's China market-focused, at least at first. Devices and the lineup may include the Xiaomi 12, the 12 Pro, the 12X, and the 12 Ultra, according to Gadget360. AT&T announced it's selling its programmatic advertising marketplace, Xander, spelled X-A-N-D-R, to Microsoft. Terms of the deal were not disclosed. Xander has formally been a part of Warner Media, and its ad unit going to Microsoft is kind of contingent on the broader deal of Warner Media merging with Discovery. In related Microsoft news, the European Union has granted unconditional approval of Microsoft's proposed acquisition of transcription tech and AI company Nuance. The EU found that the acquisition would not harm competition, in its opinion. The UK's Competition and Markets Authority has just started its own review, so the deal's not done yet. Still a few more hurdles. Back in 2015... Google launched OnHub, a $200 smart router and home hub. A year later, it launched Google Wi-Fi that had fewer smart home features with what was also less expensive and focused on mesh networking. The writing has not been on the wall for six years or so, and the writing has been scribbled. OnHub routers will stop receiving updates on December 19th, 2022. So there's some time yet, but... It's happening. After that date, the app won't work with it anymore, and OnHub users can get a discount on a Nest Wi-Fi router as a replacement. The Pixel 6 Pro can now support playing GeForce Now streaming video games at 120 frames per second in 1080p. That's the first non-Samsung phone to do so. This is, of course, the GeForce Now plan that supports up to 1440p on desktop and 4K on the NVIDIA Shield. Cost you 100 bucks for six months. NVIDIA says Pixel 6 users will need to change their quality settings to get that 120 frames per second. It won't turn itself on. Users also need at least a 25 megabit per second internet connection as well. DuckDuckGo posted details about its privacy-focused desktop web browser that it's developing as a companion to its privacy-focused search engine. CEO Gabriel Weinberg said that it would be, yet again, a browser like Brave and Firefox and Vivaldi that aims to give you privacy by default. It'll have a fire button, already seen on DDG's mobile browser, that erases your browsing history, also your stored data, and also your tabs in one click. All right, let's talk a little more about a Jack Dorsey Twitter rant. Oh, let's do it, Tom. So Web3, uh, which a lot of people consider the decentralization of everything, is hot here in the, in the waning days of 2021. Web3, you hear it a lot. Whether you care or know or do care or all the other things, it is a, you know, it's a hot word for uh, instance, Radio Shack just announced its own decentralized finance or DeFi venture, letting users trade tokens on the Ethereum blockchain. That surprised some people. Other people said, well, you know, it's the person who uh, bought Radio Shack. Render Networks, a decentralized service for 3D rendering of art, backed by NTV artist People, just raised 
$30 million. And Square CEO Jack Dorsey says, you know what? This is all a bunch of BS. Dorsey stirred the crypto bro pod uh, on Monday by posting, quote, you don't own Web3. The VCs and their LPs do. He's talking about limited partners, which is venture capital. It will never escape their incentives. It's ultimately a centralized entity with a different label. Know what you're getting into. Ooh. A few hours later, Elon Musk posted in response, has anyone seen Web3? I can't find it. To which Dorsey responded, and it's getting silly at this point, but he did. It's somewhere between A and Z. So if you're not already laughing about the crypto Twitter jokes going on here, maybe you're like, what is he, what are they even talking about? Musk is joking about the ephemeral and varying definitions of Web3. The one that you could probably figure out. Dorsey's response, a little bit more of a subtweet of a VC firm called A16Z, which funds a lot of crypto projects and has been, you know, very much in the mix as far as crypto projects go. So to go back to what Dorsey was making as a point, the point he was making was VC companies with the normal incentives that VC companies have of making returns on investments, that's why they're in business. They're making decentralized Web3 projects to the tune of $6 billion in Q3 of this year alone, 20, 2021. Dorsey argues that participants in these projects won't realize the open advantages of decentralization if there is a centralized backer looking to make more centralized profits. This may sound reasonable to you. You might say, well, that's just how capitalism works, right? But... Calling a crypto enthusiast centralized is a grave insult. A lot of people get a bit upset about this. Dorsey's contention seems to be that Bitcoin rose on its own merits without any backer and therefore has no controlling entities. Although TechCrunch's Alex Wilhelm points, points out that 0.01% of Bitcoin holders control 27% of the coins in circulation. That is a lot of people. Well, a very few amount of people <laughs> controlling a lot of money. That's far from a 51% attack, but still a concentration. Wilhelm also argues, oh, goodness. Wilhelm argues that Bitcoin enthusiasts are religious uh, in his TechCrunch article. Uh, he's saying they have unending faith in the original project, while Web3 folks uh, he says, are greedy, quote, in a manner that allows traditional investors to own toll booths and tax collectors throughout the decentralized landscape. So really what we're talking about here, is this just like like Sarah sort of implied billionaires joking around on Twitter fighting with other billionaires? Uh, or or is this something worth paying attention to? Is, J is Jack Dorsey making a fair point that uh, there are projects like Bitcoin that are truly decentralized. No one, even though there's a concentration, no one organization controls them. And these Web3 projects are, are, as a lot of people say, they're scams. They're, they're, they're ways to, yeah. to fund a venture capitalist pockets and not truly decentralized if, if one group of investors controls it. So I, I look at stuff like this and I say, you know, it, oftentimes you find that these conversations are muddled because the wrong person is delivering the message, right? So there's merit in what he's saying. If you're starting Thank a company you. and you're touting that, hey, you know, we're going to be part of this decentralized uh, era, you know, that way we don't have to, we're not beholden to anybody. We can have more open source stuff. We want to be a part of that to make the internet free, but we need to take money from investors who are going to want us to adhere to certain numbers. There, there is actually truth in that. Right. You, if these guys are giving you money, they want a return on their investment and therefore you're going to have to hit milestones. But at the same time, you don't know the intentions of the people that are starting these companies. And not, and also it's like, how else are they going to get started in today's yeah. era? So so there is truth in it, but it's just like, man, just be quiet. Sometimes you just want certain people to be quiet on certain subjects because it's just like you're the wrong person to deliver this message. I, I really don't know if Jack Dorsey and Elon Musk, you know, have some like personal beef and that's going to come to fruition in some way that, you know, we don't know about now uh, that's outside of the, you know, both companies um, 
seemed to me like they were getting along that that Jack was like yeah right Elon like because Elon's been more of a Bitcoin supporter and they're they're in opposition uh, opposition to a bunch of the the web three pushers out there uh that that try to to get folks to invest their money in their startup uh and I I think you're right Chris I think you nailed it uh Jack may not be the voice that everybody's going to listen to because people are going to assume, oh, you, you're a CEO of a finance company, Square. You know, what's your, what's your angle? I, I don't actually think he has an angle in this case. Uh, I, I think he is just trying to say, like, I think this is better technology because it is truly decentralized. But then I don't know what got up his uh, behind uh, that made him take to the web today. Right, to, why now? You know, yeah. Call everybody out. Yeah. Yeah, you've already made it. You're there. So people are not going to look at your your comments and be like, he's right. <laughs> you know well, I mean? and maybe a lot of this is posturing. I mean, who knows? I, you know, I couldn't, uh, pretend to know what, uh, what somebody might want to do to manipulate the market by saying something sort of silly and innocuous. Um, if you're Jack Dorsey, you have the power to do that. Are you going to do it? Probably not, but you know, you do have the power to do it. All right, let's talk about something practical. Bleep and Computer reports on a large-scale study of phishing attacks conducted by ETH Zurich. Over the course of 15 months, the researchers sent fake phishing emails to 14,733 participants at their regular work email address, along with deploying a button to make it easy to report phishing attempts. So they didn't know these emails were fake, but they gave them a button to be like, hey, if you see a phishing attempt, report it, whether it was real or part of the test. The study was trying to determine which employees fell for phishing attempts, how that vulnerability evolved over time, how effective embedded training and warnings in email clients were, and what employees might be able to do to help stop phishing. Previously, there had been a gender breakdown on this, but they found gender not to be a factor in this study, whereas age was. The younger and older people in the study were more prone to fall for attacks than those in the middle. And people who use software for repetitive tasks were more likely to get fished than those who did not need computers for their day-to-day -day work. The more often people were exposed to phishing, the more likely they were to fall for it. You, you just kind of wore down their resistance. And people who fell once were more likely to fall for it again uh, than, than people who had not fallen for it, which I guess kind of makes sense because you've fallen for it once, but it, it was more likely for them to fall for any given phishing email if they had already fallen once before. Warnings were effective in the email clients, but increasing the detail in the warnings didn't change it. Just having the warning was as effective as trying to tell people more info. And simulated phishing exercises and voluntary training actually turned out in this study to make people more susceptible, not less. To the attacks, kind of tying into that when they saw more attempts, it wore down their defenses. As to that reporting button they implemented, it was 68% accurate overall and usually submitted in a timely enough fashion that it could provide increased protection without adding a sizable workload. So that seemed to be a good idea as well. Takeaway seems to be that warning and reporting buttons are the best ways to protect people from phishing attacks here. Not that education is bad, but some of these training things can do more harm than good if you're not careful. Oh, I mean, I, as somebody who uh, I feel pretty internet literate, uh, there are phishing attacks that I sometimes I'm like, I'm about to press the button. I'm like, oh, wait a second. Ah, crap. Oh, I see what you're doing. It is not like you don't have to, you know, say like, oh, it's only people that don't understand the internet that are, you know, fall victim to this. It's all of us. Um, and because they've gotten so much smarter over time. And and yeah, I think I think anything that is like the big red button to say, don't do this, you're gonna regret it, it's gonna be a problem, is a good thing. Yeah, so I, I looked at this article and the more I read it and reread it, it, it kind of invoked a couple of different thoughts that uh, were, it made me mad a little bit. And uh, first off, let me, let me go to the first, the biggest one, which was the same, the part where it said the training was, uh, didn't help and, and it actually made matters worse. And I think that's the wrong takeaway from that part of the training, right? Or that part of the study. Uh, honestly, if you're saying, look at this email, is it good? Is it bad? Look at this email. Is it good? Is it bad? 
that's not going to help the person because you're asking them to analyze things that they have no idea about. Instead, mm. the takeaway should have been the training we're doing is ineffective and we need to find better training to help these people determine not to click on these type of emails. And it really should just get from a, a basic starting point. Don't trust anything you get, right? <laughs> Then move on. Well, but from if there. you're if if you're in a you know large enterprise company, right, and you're telling people, you know, you just got to look at the emails more closely, and that's not working, then what do you do? Yeah, I, yeah. I, to me, I this is the same advice I give coworkers, I give to my my own family. Do not trust emails that you get, you know, because inevitably, slowly, especially if they're out of character for what you get for emails, right. If you look at an email and you get a person, a, a, hey, here's a joke for you. Or here's the document you've been waiting for. I haven't been waiting for any document. Let me click on this document. No, 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 no. You're not waiting for any document. Don't click that email. You know what I mean? Mm. And I can't tell you how many times in my regular job that I'll send a message to a person like, hey, did you just send me a document? Did you just send me an email? No, I did not. Okay. Check your email. Check your password. I just got a spam message from you. Mm -hmm. Right? As opposed to. You know, yes, I did. I needed you to see this and, you know, take a look at it and get your opinion. Okay, then we're good. You know what I mean? Just creating better habits for receiving those emails. With the, with the people that are supposedly sending the emails, right? <laughs> if you can have a conversation about, what, you know, hey, did you send me this? And the person's like, yes or no, then you're, you're kind of smooth sailing. But I think so many people don't do that. Well, and not, you, don't reply to the suspicious email yeah, right no, reach out to don't the do person that. separately yes. right reach yeah. out to them directly but you know a lot of these phishing emails are just sent at a bunch of people or targeted to somebody who may have access to what these people are looking for or they don't know they just want to get uh, any credentials on the network so they can then span out from there right so they're just sending random emails to people and it's like you know they may send it in you know, a spoof the header and try to get uh somebody you know, to recognize it you know but if you're definitely getting an email from outside, you know, that you, it's going to be easier to recognize that you probably should not click on it. Right. But unfortunately, you know, if we're just telling people, look at this, this looks like fishing, just look at this, this doesn't look like fishing. I, I think that's the, that's the wrong approach. Uh, in, yeah. And in my I, I don't think the the study was trying to say never train people. I, I, I think that that may be, you know, no, it might I, be I didn't think that was the study. Yeah. I thought it was the conclusion in the article. But I, but opposed. I think what they're saying, ETH Zurich is saying is, Simulated phishing exercises, that's not it. Uh, voluntary embedded training didn't seem to work. There, there are other ways of training people that work. And what, going back to what Sarah was saying, everybody on our best day has a moment where we just almost get fooled, right? Oh, yeah, 100%. And, 100%. And, the, and that makes perfect sense that the more often you're exposed to it, the more chances at bat you have uh, to strike out and, and, and fall for it. So warnings and other things that are automated to kind of backstop you like you know the right kind of training and and some backstops uh that seems like a good takeaway from yeah, all so, of this so and the other thing is though is i'm happy that they're actually doing a study on this yeah, because yeah. phishing is, is 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 real you know what i mean oh, yeah. and a lot of these companies get had because one person i remember it was a government agency in the last i think 10 years that got hit pretty hard, all because somebody said, hey, I'm your network administrator. I need you to send me your password. Oh, pff, yeah. no problem. Here's your password. You know what <laughs> yeah, I mean? And, and yeah. it's a wrap. That person was that. not, in fact. The network. <laughs> <laughs> and so, Spoiler. you know, I, to I told my mom very simply, you know, when I gave her email, I said, mom, if it doesn't look like an email you don't you get on a regular basis, contact me. That's it. You yeah. know, and it has been very effective. My mom has never, you know, whatever, whatever you want to do, it has That's never. Good you know, been victim of that because I scared her you know, on those messages, right? It was like, uh-uh, you know, don't ever click anything. And she's very good about calling me. It's like, hey, I just got this message. I'll take a log into her email. Take a look. Like, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> nah, nah, that's not a good one. Like, no, no, this was okay. And I think we need to be very diligent about that, especially as we continue to see hacks and uh, network breaches on the rise. You know, we definitely need to be more diligent about, finding ways to break through to our coworkers and to our family members. Well, about a lot of it, you know, emails. as, as our financial lives turn more and more online, at least for some of us, you know, for me, for example, it's like, if I get a so, somewhat strange email from Venmo being like, Hey, just want to like 
make sure that your last transaction was kosher. You know, I sometimes I'm like, okay, yeah, I, I did just do that. Okay, let's make sure it's kosher. Oh, good. No, no. Right, <laughs> right, right. Scam. You know, like it, it truly, it, it preys on your h- habits. Yep. Yeah, your, habits, your... inattention, fatigue, you know, yeah. all, all of that. All sort those of things. Yeah. Definitely. All right. Let, let's 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 move on to something a little more positive here. Uh, let's just shed some sunshine into this episode, Chris. Yeah, Chris. All right. Let me let me brighten it up a little bit. So back in 2020, the U.S. had less than a gigawatt of large battery installations. That's enough to power about 350,000 homes for a few hours. How about now? S&P Global Market Intelligence says that U.S. should finish. 2021 with seven gigawatts worth of battery installations and looks on pace to add nine more gigawatts by the end of 2023, which would bring the total to 16 gigawatts. Battery storage has been long cited as one of the limiting factors on renewable energy as the sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow. But the installations are finally increasing at a significant pace. The Wall Street Journal notes that battery installations often are replacing gas-fired plants that only fire up in times of peak demand. So why is it financially picking up? Finally picking up? Battery costs have fallen steeply. A pack that cost $1,200 per kilowatt hour in 2010 now costs $132. And this isn't a regional thing. Projects are taking place across the country, including Oklahoma, Michigan, Arizona, Maryland, not just California, New York, and Texas. It's not all rosy, though. Higher prices for raw materials could slow down growth, though tax incentives might be able to offset inflation. And it's not just industrial that's growing. The residential market for home battery installations is expected to grow by more than a billion dollars next year. Why are the battery prices dropping so much? Uh, Phones and EVs. Uh, we, we, We hit that economy of scale and improve technologies for for manufacturing because we needed to make all those batteries for smartphones and those batteries for smartphones kind of drove the price down they got ev adoption electric vehicle adoption has pushed it even farther so that seems to be part of it as well as some subsidies and things here and there in various states and countries uh, around the world but yeah we're we're finally getting to the point where this is cost effective enough it has enough scale that utilities, uh, you see that number, like going from one to seven to 16, like that's, mm-hmm. that's starting to snowball. And this has been a long time coming where people are like, yeah, solar's great, but if you can't use it right away, it's gone. Uh, right. And and if you can, you can start to add enough gigawatts of this, then it's not gone. It's amazing to me that, that companies like power plants are not leading the way with this technology. It's like solar technology and batteries back because it behooves them to be able to constantly provide energy. They can provide it and charge for it and even for the maintain maintenance of the plants. You know, like here in, in Maryland, we actually have a lot of power lines that are above ground, which is terrible, right? It's a bad storm, they hit, you know, go down and you mm-hmm. lose power. You know, and they, we've been after uh, folks, to, you know, these, some of these companies for years to bury the line, so they stop breaking. And, uh, you yeah, know, I was talking to a, a friend of the family who actually works for a ma- who worked for a major power line. They're like, you know, people say we want to bury these lines, but they don't want to see the cost of that. And that cost is going to get transferred right back to you. You know, so the fact that you can actually just do something like let's get this new battery technology going, let's get these uh, solar pa- uh, information technology going, because honestly, if my power company says pay extra five bucks a month, but we can guarantee you more uptime because we're investing in solar power and battery backups. I don't have to put stuff on my roof, right? I can just rely on them. And to me, it's, it's, it just seems like, you know, them, car dealerships, why are they not leading the way on uh, EVs and stuff like that? It's just, I never, I never understand this stuff. Well, folks, if you understand it and can explain it to Chris, uh, please get in our Discord. You can you can you can do that uh, by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com/slash/dtns. 
For a while now, we have bemoaned the centralization of the internet and the rise of a handful of tech giants that dominate our tech choices. More than once, I, I have wondered who the next company might be that could wrest power away from Alphabet, Meta, and Amazon, the way they arrested it away from the IBMs, HPs, and Oracles of the past. I've looked at TikTok, ByteDance, TikTok's parent company, other Chinese companies. Is that going to be it? Is it going to be Spotify? Is it going to be Snap? But the answer may have been under our nose for a while. Protocol's David Pierce has an article up today called, Can Matt Mullenweg Save the Internet? Now, if you recognize that name, you probably think of him as the WordPress guy, and rightly so. Mullenweg developed and continues to help develop WordPress, which is still a fully open source project. His company, Automatic, does not own WordPress, though. It uses the open source project as the basis for a web hosting service called WordPress.com. Daily Tech News Show has been on the open source version of WordPress for all of its life, and in recent years began being hosted by WordPress.com itself. What you may not realize is Automatic also runs an e-commerce plugin called WooCommerce, a private personal journaling app called Day One, the analytics tool Parsley, cloud note taking service Simple Note, the classic simple blogging service Tumblr, that's owned by Automatic now, and more recently, podcast app Pocket Casts. It's quite a collection. Mullenweg has said that his goal is to build the, quote, Berkshire Hathaway of the Internet, made up of what he considers are the most important products and services in tech. And each one is built with open source software and a commitment to the open web as a priority. This isn't just idealistic. Automatic is a $7.5 billion private company. And get this, 43% of websites on the Internet run on WordPress's open source platform. If that was Alphabet... There would be constant antitrust investigation into the works right now, but Automatic doesn't exercise control over all those installations. They're open source. Automatic isn't controversy. You don't hear about it in the rage-filled corners of the internet, and it's a private company controlled by Mullenweg, so you don't hear about it in the hype-filled money-making corners of the internet either. A lot of Pierce's protocol article is about Mullenweg's belief that the pendulum always swings between closed and open, and we're just at the end of one of those swings right now. He sees Web3 as a manifestation of that swing back towards openness. He told Pierce, there's an inevitable gravitational pull towards open source, affecting literally every field, finance, health, politics. But that doesn't mean that he thinks that every Web3 project is good. In a recent yearly company address, Mullenweg warned, for every project which is asking for your money, dollars, for you to pay the cost of a house for a picture of an ape, you should ask, does it apply the same freedoms which WordPress itself does? How closely does it apply to increasing your freedom and agency in the world? So there you go, Jack. There's the way to decide if a Web3 project is good or not. Ask Matt. Yeah, yeah. During their conversation for his article, Pierce says Mullenweg sent him an email, which Pierce thinks sums up what Mullenweg believes in. It's a quote from Albert Camus. The only way to deal with an unfree world is to become so absolutely free that your very existence is an act of rebellion. That is better than don't be evil. That is better than move fast and break things. Uh, what do you think, no, Chris? Well, it makes a lot more sense. But yes, Chris, please ban. So I, I, when I read this article, it, it actually invoked quite a bit of emotional uh, thought in me because... I was at first I was very skeptic. I was like, oh, come on, dude, you, you're, you're not living in the real world. And I got mad at myself because I was like, man, this guy's got so much hope for the Internet. So why are you you know, looking down at him? Look down at yourself. Let this dude be him. But I, I, as I got to the end of it and started realizing, I think it's great what his standpoint. And I love the fact that that he is maintaining it and living his truth. But I think the biggest problem we have is, is not that it, the folks that listen to this podcast and podcasts like this are educated in these things and they understand why people are mad at Facebook and Twitter for their use of our data and our use of our information and the monetizing that information and how they you know, any company that comes up with an ability to gather more information, they snatch that company up as quickly as possible. But the majority of the users that are providing this information have no idea what is wrong with Facebook and Google and Microsoft and all of these companies. In fact, I would be willing to bet that if you ask the majority of people, what is wrong with Facebook? What is wrong with Twitter? They'll say they're stifling our free speech. Mm. Not they're taking our data mm. and monetizing it. 
And so or they're while, too big, some kind of vague, big, they're, yeah, they're too and they big. can continue yeah, yeah. to do that and they can mm-hmm. put themselves in the position to continue to do that. So I love this article because it does provide some hope for making a better internet. But I think w- one of the things we need to do is we need to figure out how can we get more people to understand why this is important? Why well, what he's saying is important. What I, what I like about this is Mullenweg's answer to that seems to be build it so that there is a compelling thing for yeah. them to go do. Don't shout at them and hope you change their mind. Yeah. And, you know, when you spread stuff like that and you're like, oh, man, this guy really is hopeful. And I really appreciate that. You know, and so I, I love the article and I love what he, Mullenweg is doing. You know, and there's a couple of other platforms I would love to see because it really seems like he's laid out a path. Right. You you create this one platform. I'm going to buy this other platform and keep it open source. You take yeah. this one. I'm going to go buy the opposite. If he goes after YouTube, that's I think that's something that can have like a big, you know, impact, right? So people will start paying attention. But like he said, it would know, also be totally crazy. But it would. yes, it would. You know, but it yeah. would make noise, make waves. But you know, the, the guy has a plan, and I love the fact of that too, right? He's like, I can't take on every aspect of the mm-hmm. internet, right? I got to yeah. do it in in pieces where it makes sense. But I really love, you know, to how he. You know, the article spoke piece about by piece, piece yeah. by piece, the companies that he chooses to invest in or have him join. You know, they don't all just join in the same manner. Right. Some of them are partners. Some of them become subsidiaries. But he's he really seems to have some thought process of how he wants to achieve his goal. And I think, uh, you know, one of one of the best things that I saw my company do that I work that I work at is like they started coming out with these plans from the top level. And then they said, okay, here's my agenda. How can you contribute to helping me achieve that goal, right? So it started from the top down. Mm. And it seems like he has that same mantra, right? Here's a company that I want to get to keep the internet open and free and and open source. How can this company help me achieve that? Do you want to be a part of this dream? And I love the fact that so many of the companies that he purchased, Pocket Cast and all of them, had that same aspect and that same inspiration. So it was, it, I was really hopeful at the end of this article about what he's trying to achieve. And, you know, now I'm thinking, how can I support this cat to make uh-huh. sure that he achieves his goal? So I really love what he's doing. But I think it really starts with making sure more people understand what's truly going on in, in the Internet and, you know, the monetization. Because I don't think it's just going to bounce back or it's going to level itself out so easily, right? Because these companies put themselves in a greater, greater position to keep themselves in that in that in that pole position and so we got to figure out it just just takes time every every time a company looks too big to fail just just wait wait. (laughs) well speaking of thanks uh we'd like to extend a special thanks to jerry tolbert one of our top lifetime supporters for dtns thank you jerry for all the years of support yay jerry also, thanks to you, Chris Ashley. You were on fire today. Uh, let folks know where they can keep up with all of your uh, um, great musings in in the rest of the world. Well, first off, thank you guys for having me this year. I had a great time on every single episode. Folks, if you want to check me out, always come check me out. Me and my homies on SMR Podcast. We just may talk about anything on there. But also check us out on our new venture, Barbecue and Tech. Rod and I... Uh, are having a blast sharing our conversations about barbecue and the tech that we use to facilitate it. You know, it could be something as using a spoon to take the the membrane off of ribs all the way up to a controller to, to keep the perfect temperature on your smoker. So just having a blast talking that stuff and sharing some of our cutting boards and the new lane board is up on the store where uh, you know we honor some of our favorite people out there. So yeah, check us out. Oh, I, I was so excited to see that today. Well, uh, thank you, Chris Ashley, for being with us. We are live on the show Monday through Friday, all weekdays, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 21.30 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're going to be back doing it all again tomorrow with Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. This podcast is part of the Frog Pen Studios Network. For more information about this and other shows, visit frogpants.com. Audio program so good, it's like you're there. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. (laughs)